Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Talking Cardboard. My name is Corey. And I'm Nick. And today is our top 10 most disappointing board games. Games that we were very excited to get to the table and try and to play and just kind of fell short of our expectations. So let's get started. All right, and starting with our number 10, Nick, what's the number 10 game? So I don't know if this was a fever dream or if this actually happened in my lifetime, but I swear <laughs> about 20 years ago, I was in a Target store and I remember seeing this game on the shelf called Cowboy's Way of the Gun. <laughs> now, at that time, I don't think Target probably had many hobby games, so to see an obscure game like that makes me think it was a fever dream, but I swear it was actually happened it actually happened okay point is is i never actually purchased the game at the time i was a kid so it's like oh that looks cool but i wasn't going to haggle my mom for it fast forward a few years and i see that this game is getting a second edition as a kickstarter so of course i back it because this was the game that i saw several years ago in a target store as a kid now i'm actually going to buy it myself and it said it had a solo co-op mode so that got me more excited since i'm really into solo and co-op games yeah finally get it to the, uh, to the doorstep, bring it in, and there's actually a, a YouTube video on our channel of me doing a playthrough of a solo scenario of this game, and it just fell flat. Unfortunately, the solo system was literally just a, uh, a small chart where you're rolling a die and doing what, you know, the action that you end up rolling, and it was very, very, very simple. Essentially, you could play this game two-handed. It's a, And what the game is, it's just a tactical cowboy game cowboy fighting game where you're mm -hmm. moving your cowboy around the map and the enemy's doing the same. There's a few different weapons, but that was part of what also fell flat for me is there's only like three weapons, shotgun, rifle, pistol, not a lot of variety there. Rules were very light. So even if you were playing with another human, I wouldn't even say that would have made me that much more excited about the game. So unfortunately, I now I'm trying to sell this one uh, just because the game didn't offer me enough of what I was hoping it would. Bad on me for not doing a little more research on the game, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I, I think I'd rather just be playing with my cowboy figures as a boy than trying <laughs> sure. to play this this board game, which was unfortunate because I did have some high hopes, but unfortunately, yeah. I no longer want to have it in my collection. So that's Cowboys 2. Well, going into number nine is my pick, my first pick here for this list, and it is a newer Alexander Pfister game, one of my favorite designers of all time, and this game is Maracaibo. Maracaibo, I was extremely excited to get at PAX Unplugged 2019, yes, pre-pandemic, all those years ago, and I picked it up, super excited. I wanted to get it played right away there in the Airbnb that we were staying at at the time. Never did really get it, but finally got it to the table back at home, and it just fell a little bit flat. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time by Alexander Pfister is Great Western Trail, mm. and that just, the card manipulation and management and different uh, going around um, to those different worker placement spots up the trail is just the actions you're actually doing on that trail and in that system especially with the with the with the card management is just a lot more exciting and a little bit more thematic and intuitive and I think that's just kind of what fell flat in Maracaibo for me. It's just more of like a pirate themed game that uh, had some cool concepts to it but I just don't think the card play and uh, and the mechanisms behind what you're doing really played into the theme as much as like a great western trail did for for me. So that's number 9. Nick, what's number eight? So number eight for me would be the game Fleet Commander Nimitz. <clears throat> so there's a board game company called DVG Games and they specialize essentially in solitaire war games. And honestly, they're, they're a very good company. A lot of solitaire war games really think highly of DVG Games. And one of the first solitaire war games I ever got was from DVG called Field Commander Rommel, which is a, a very solid design. Their games are very approachable, not too rule heavy, which makes them, I think, well received by the, the wargaming community. One game that they published was called Fleet Commander Nimitz, which allows you to s simulate the Pacific theater of World War II, pretending you are Fleet Commander Nimitz himself, managing your fleets across the ocean, on of, the ocean of the Pacific, and then moving your ships to various islands, and then having battles on those islands with your Marines and, and airplanes. And it combined two um, kind of theaters of war, which you don't see very often in war games, where you have the strategic level gameplay, where you're moving your ships from island to island, and then the tactical level gameplay, where you're actually resolving a combat on this little island map. 
And at first I was really excited about this game because it did some things I hadn't seen another war game, other war games do. But when I finally played through it, which you can watch the uh, the video on our YouTube channel of me playing through this game, it it just was it was kind of a slog fest. I, I felt like I wasn't really having a lot of fun. Unfortunately, um, what would happen a lot is I'd have these huge. Uh, one side have like 20 units to my one or two units or vice versa and you still feel like you have to move everything to this battle map to fight this kind of pointless battle but there's really no way to streamline the resolution of the combat. The original rule set allowed you to just like willy-nilly move the Japanese ships who's played by the AI system around which thematically didn't make sense. The Japanese didn't just send a destroyer to Alaska. They did come out then with an expansion a few years later to try to make sure all the ships would move it in a uh, organized fleet which is more thematic but then that introduced other inconsistencies with the rules that weren't really resolved in my opinion and still left me feeling like it wasn't a complete game experience even though i really wanted this game to work out for me so i eventually did sell it to someone else hmm. um so that's fleet commander nimitz a game that almost checked all the boxes of what i wanted in a pacific theater world war ii solitaire game but just didn't quite meet the mark and left me disappointed hmm. So that was my number eight. Corey, what's number seven? Number seven is my next pick here, and it is Western Legends. I don't know how many of you remember the game Western Legends, because it's been quite a few years now since it first came out. Plenty of expansions also that I haven't really gotten to the table, so maybe that would be a, a more invigorating experience for me. But I just remember getting the game to the table with the group years and years ago with the base game. And it was represented or marketed as an open world, old west game where you could pretty much just go around and do whatever you want. You could become an outlaw, you could, you know, error out the good side of things and be more lawful. You can play poker hands. Uh, they're just, it's a very thematic game in the setting itself, but the actual gameplay is what fell flat for me. From what little I remember about the game, it's essentially you are just moving around the board and you can do different actions at the different locations you end up at, but I just felt like each of the actions you could partake in were very lackluster and mm. fell very flat with it, didn't really feel too, like there was too much strategy involved in what you were doing. A lot of player interaction, sure, but I just didn't feel like there was enough structure there to really play around with whether or not there was player interaction uh, or enough of it uh, that didn't really matter as much not having that structure to really play an actual game with so like i said some of the expansions like the runaway train and the different heists and different things going on more thematic elements thrown into the game and i know i know it throws other mechanisms and other um, strategic options into the game as well so i believe those other expansions did make the game a better game from what i've read online but i have not tried that yet so Western Legends just fell flat with me. Hearing you talk about your disappointment for Western Legends is disappointing me because, <laughs> like, I was a game that I always thought looked really cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I don't need to play it and if and would have a similar experience as you did. Well, pick it up with all the expansions and see if that yeah. if that helps it. So, on to uh, on to Nick for number six. All right, so number six for me is another game that I backed on Kickstarter with with maybe not. An appropriate amount of research and that's Hellenica Story of Greece. Mm. So this game was I think on Kickstarter several years ago and essentially it's a large um, dudes on a map style 4x style board game for um, simulating ancient Greece and you can play as the different factions of that era such as Greece themselves and Macedonia and Sparta and essentially like a dudes on a map style game you're trying to build armies and take over your neighbors and there's there is infrastructure involved there's buildings that you can put out on the table in addition to just raising forces and and, and then there's also mythology incorporated into the game you can have the different greek mythology characters come into the game too which uh, at the time i thought would be kind of fun what really sold me on the game is that it could be played solo or co-op there was like this ai system built into the game so finally get it and open it up and start reading through the rules and I realized that I just didn't feel compelled to play the game, partly because it, there was no asymmetry. Hmm. Here you have all these diverse factions that are supposed to represent nations that probably were very different from each other, but everyone had the exact same faction, has the same player board. Hmm. You have the same structures, the same tech tree, essentially, the same units. There was just no flavor between the different nations. Yeah. And the AI system itself also didn't really have a lot of variety to it. And so I never even bothered playing the game. And 
eventually decided to sell it to someone else. The game that I'm looking forward to that I backed on Kickstarter, <laughs> which hopefully won't disappoint me, is Rome Total War because that um, is what I, that the PC game Rome Total War is what interested me in getting Hellenica to begin with because mm -hmm. I was hoping to have kind of a similar experience that I did in the PC game Rome Total War and now coincidentally enough there's a board game coming out based on the PC game which does make sure that all the armies are asymmetric and the tech trees for the different um, nations are asymmetric so that looks like the experience that I hoping I will enjoy um, but I haven't received it yet so stay tuned on that one but for now, number six for me for disappointing games was Hellenica Story of Greece. Corey, what's your number five? My number five is a hot take. It's a Ooh. legacy game that is well beloved in the community and one that just, I, it didn't fall flat for me, but it, this, is, this is higher up on the list because it just did not meet the high, high expectations I had for it. And this is Clank Legacy. Ooh. Clank Legacy, I love all the iterations of Clank. I really love the deck building. I love the exploration. I love picking up the different items to get points and everything you're doing in Clank. You know, making noise, making the Clank to have the dragon or whatever you know version of the game you have come after you is very thematic. It's very thematic for a deck building game. Love it to bits. And I just had even an even higher expectation for the Clank Legacy version of this game on, ooh, what world are we going to explore now? And what new things are we going to be able to do as we play during, you know, during the different episodes of this game? And it just didn't really play out as interesting as I thought it would. You know, I, without spoiling it, you know, it's hard to talk about a legacy game without adding in spoilers. But without spoiling it, yeah, it has those common legacy tropes. You're adding different stickers to the board and it's got that sense of exploration, but just not enough of a storyline to it for me. Not enough theme poured into it, not enough interesting theme poured into it that I thought was really kind of a swing and a miss on the designer's part. I think with that type of a, a structure, mechanisms, world building, with that type of uh, information to work with, I felt like they could have done a lot more with it. So that is Clank Legacy. On to Nick for number four. All right, so my number four is a game called 1775 Rebellion, published by Academy Games. And um, just like with DVG, I want to start off by saying Academy Games is, is, a, is a great publisher. I, unfortunately, this game just wasn't for me. But one thing that um, Academy Games, I think, prides itself on is trying to make games that are very historical and, and, and in a sense, then educational. And 1775 Rebellion is a another dudes on a map style game that also is trying to kind of give you a little bit of an education on the American Revolution. It can be played either 1v1 or a team. There's four different uh, factions to play as the Patriots, uh, the Militia, or the, I think the Con Continental Army, the Militia for the, the Patriot player. And then the opposing player, I think, is the uh, British and the, the Tories. And, and they're all different colored cubes, right? They're all different <laughs> colored cubes. But anyway, the point the point is, is I was I've had this game in my collection. I purchased it several years ago. Finally, got it to the table just a couple months ago, and I thought it'd be more of an engaging experience and feel more thematic, especially given the fact that Academy Games, like I said, is it tries to make their games educational. But at the end of the day, it felt like a very unthematic dudes on a map experience. You, you, every round, every side's always getting four cubes for reinforcements. I was like, that that why why is every side getting the same amount of reinforcements? That didn't seem very realistic to me. Mm. The Native Americans are are kind of a neutral faction, and anyone can take over them if they just move into their territory and and abs basically absorb them, which also didn't seem very thematic. I felt like there should be a little more to that aspect of the game a more pushback from them yeah like yeah like yeah. they're i don't know what it would, what mecha mechanisms needed to be added to, for that part of the game and then also when it is your turn you're choosing from three cards and the card decks are technically asymmetric for each faction but they're really at the end of the day isn't a lot of difference in what the cards are actually doing mm. the british player maybe has one more ship movement card than the other factions because they had more naval power so they're trying to sim simulate that aspect of the game as much as i do think 1775 rebellion is at least a step, a small step above a game like Risk in terms of a dudes on a map game with a little more complexity. Mm. It wasn't enough meat on the bone for me to want to play it again, and therefore I um, am deciding to finally sell it out of my collection. That is really disappointing because that is a game I've been wanting to try. 
Uh, and it looks more Eurocentric for like a war style game, which I thought looked appealing to me too. But after hearing that description, I don't know. I mean, you're selling it, so we'll see. Maybe I'll pick it up from you and give it a shot myself. But yeah, that is disappointing to hear. All right, so that 1775 Rebellion was my number four. Corey, what's your number three? Number three pick on the list here for me is a system that I wasn't too intrigued to get involved in when it first came out because it was a giant big box system that was just looked overwhelming. Too much content, hundreds of hours of gameplay in a box, and I just don't have that much time in a lifetime to even sit down and play a game, let alone doing other things in my life. Uh, but when the smaller version of this game came out, I was very excited to try it. And this is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. It's marketed again as more of a Eurocentric dungeon crawl, kill monsters, get items and loot, uh, go through different scenarios in the map. And it's higher up on the list here because I did enjoy the game enough to, I, I wouldn't say no to playing it again, but my expectation for it being the same system as Gloomhaven, you know, top five game now of all time on VGG or whatever it is now is number one for a while but put into a smaller, more bite-sized, manageable time management system. I was so excited to play. And at the end of the day, I've played through the first handful of scenarios, at least maybe six or seven of the scenarios now. Each one feels very similar to the last. Mm. The mechanisms and gameplay evolve with each game, so it gets a little bit more complex, but not really that much. I mean, you're getting some, some uh, new cards that are a little bit more complex for the actions you're playing, but really it comes down to play a card, move your guy, play another card to attack something, and move on. You know, maybe, maybe as the scenarios go on, it'll get more complex and more decision space for mm -hmm. the strategy you're making in the game. But for now, it's definitely real high up there on the, on the disappointing list for me. It just kind of fell flat for me. Yeah, I actually have a copy in my collection too that's still in shrink. So haven't played it myself yet, but um, a little disappointed to hear about Corey's disappointment. I played the big box version okay. of Gloomhaven on using the Steam app. Mm. I wasn't necessarily a huge fan of the, the bigger box version just because I felt a lot of the items and that you get don't really have a huge effect. And yeah. you know, you spend a lot of your going your hard earned coins to get something that lets you move one extra space for the whole scenario. It just the coolest thing that Jaws of the Lion does that I think the digital version of the big box does is that it makes setup more oh, yeah. streamlined. That's good then. You're just opening opening sure. the binder folder and you're playing on the map on the folder. You don't have to deal with all those tiles and setup. Mm. So I think that if you enjoy Gloomhaven but you just don't like the setup time, that'll completely fix that for Which you. Which is why I would try Jaws of the Lion, because yeah. I would never try the physical version of Big Box Gloomhaven, exactly. knowing that yeah. the computer's doing all that work for me. <laughs> exactly. So. Yep. So that is number three, Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. Nick, on to your top pick, which is number two for this list. What is the most disappointing game for you? So the most disappointing game for me is called Defense of Procyon. I want to say it's either two or three. Five. Three. Is it three? <laughs> I think it's three, yeah. Defense of Pro... I don't... I'm so disappointed I forgot the number. <laughs> but anyway... It uh, is a Roman numeral. <laughs> Defense of Procyon, Roman numerals. And that's because when I first heard, out, heard about this game, it sounded... It intrigued me immediately because it's essentially a... A, 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 they call it, some call it a waro because it's a cross between a war game and a euro, yeah. but more it's really we'll say it a war game for simplicity's sake. And what makes it different from other war games is that you have two theaters of of conflict. There's a of uh, a land battle where you have this alien land race or faction. We'll call it alien land faction against the human land faction, and then you have this space theater where you have the alien uh, space faction against the um, human space faction, which means the game can be played 2v2 in a team setting, but also the game promoted a solitaire system that was designed by David Turtsey, who's a famous solitaire mode designer, and then also each theater uh, uh, impacts the, the other theater and vice versa. So stuff that's going on in that space battle will have an effect on the land battle and stuff going on the land battle can affect the space battle. Um, I won't go into the details of how the, the game works and all that. It's a really cool idea though. It's a really cool idea. Yeah. You don't see this type of game very often. Um, even for, from a historical war game perspective, I wish that th they would do that more, whether alone just in a sci-fi setting. But what frustrated me with this game is that Every faction of the four plays completely differently mechanically. Every faction is its own little mini game where some have cards that you, and you can only do certain things based on the cards you have in your hand. Mm -hmm. I was playing as the human space faction and it was kind of like this deck 
deconstruction game where I was trying to streamline my hand of cards so I could do more things with my ships. But at the end of the day, I have like these big capital ships and I just want to blow stuff up and I can't because I'm constrained by this hand of cards I have. And then also there's like this technology thing in, a, added to my faction where every turn I have a, a new technology I can use, but it just felt odd to me that this technology comes and goes and I have to switch out my technology card with a new one the next round and that previous one's gone. And it's just the thematic connection didn't wasn't there for me. I felt like I was just playing this little mechanism game for the sake of playing that and not actually getting to enjoy myself playing this, what could otherwise be this epic space battle game. And I wish at the end of the day, all factions basically more or less were playing the same mechanically and you just had a space battle going on, you're moving units, rolling dice for combat. And same thing on the land, in the, in the land theater of the game. Um, so with for that reason, I decided I um, planned to get rid of it and was disappointed with just kind of this, you know, these mechanisms that I felt were there just to make the game kind of fancy instead yeah. of more fun. I don't too know. many moving parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah when, when I played it too, I felt the same way. If it was a, if it was designed in a way easy to set up, everybody everybody kind of was an asymmetric faction with different powers, but kind of played out mechanically the same yes. way. That would yeah. have just definitely meant that made the mm -hmm. game even that much better. Um, I thought it was okay when we played it, um, but it definitely seemed like it was complex for complexity's sake. So that was my personal number one disappointing game, but what's number one for our list in this video, Corey? Number one for our list, number one for me was uh, obviously a game that I was really excited about for for mechanical reasons and gameplay reasons and some of the research that I've done, but also because a lot of the content I've watched online for this game is like best game of all time, 10 out of 10, must buy, must play, and just the hype surrounding this game was just just so great. This game is Earth. Hmm. Earth. Uh, it was it, it was touted almost like an Ark Nova killer, and I really like Ark Nova a lot. It's a complex game. Earth is set up to kind of do a similar thing where it's kind of a tableau builder. You've got a bunch of combos going on with the cards. Every card does something different, and it's just it's supposed to kind of play out kind of like an Ark Nova setting, you know, with animals or different Earth aspects, like thematically also a little bit similar to Ark Nova, but in a lot quicker time frame, like more of like an hour versus three hours. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited to try that. And from all the all the different things going on with comboing to try to get points, I just thought that looked like a lot of fun. But when we got to the table, it just fell really, really flat for me. And I think it fell flat for the same reasons, like if you've played Terraforming Mars, why that game fell so flat for me is it just, there was just too much comboing or too much overload. overload. You know, every card did something different and comboed with another card and it just got yeah. to, you know, I use that word convoluted a lot or overload a lot when it comes to something that is negative for me and this game definitely had all that for me. Too much going on, not enough payoff for what was going on. I wasn't overly excited about getting points. Again, like this this game was throwing up points left and right. It was almost like a point salad overload uh, on top of the decisions um, and combo overload, overload as well. So everything going on this with this just did not have enough payoff for as, as much of, um, you know, as much that was going on. So. Really, really hope to like this one. Played it once or twice and immediately got rid of it, unfortunately. So that was my number one, Earth. That does it and wraps up for today's list of our top 10 collective disappointing games of all time. I don't know, maybe we'll seek out these games eventually in the future if they have like a second or third edition or if they make, a, you know, streamline them in different ways, but we'll have to see, only time will tell. But until next time, you all have a great day and have fun gaming.